Hi again. I want to talk with you about an awful hmm, ever overlooked message. It has nothing to do with um, the political thing going on in our life that we you know, come to voting all the time. It's not a political issue that I want to talk with you about, but it's titled Vote for You Are Registered. And it takes on a very interesting meaning when I use that word vote in this message. And you're going to find out what I mean here as this unfolds for you. When I think about what God is wanting to do in our life, and I'm sure that you want to do that too, wanting to know what His will is, we can take the word vote, V-O-T-E, and apply something to each one of the letters. And this is what I came up with. For the word victorious is the V. And we think about Jesus, he was victorious over sin, over death, over hell, over the grave, and over death. It had no play in his part, in his life. And Jesus wants us to have this victory also in our life. And how is this done? It, it's done through love. Romans chapter 8 tells us this. I'm going to read from verse 31 through 37. Listen to this. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger danger or sword as it is written for your sake we face death all day long we are considered as sheep for the slaughter no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us so Jesus wants us to be victorious through God's love that works in us. And that's what we see here. We're more than conquerors. God has given us that victory through Jesus. That's the V. The O is overcomer, or being an overcomer. Jesus was an overcomer, and he wants us to be an overcomer also. And how has that worked out? It's through faith. Faith is the key. 1 John chapter 5 tells us this. This is the law for God, to obey His commands, and His commandments are not burdensome. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Faith makes you and I an overcomer, just as Jesus was an overcomer. The T stands for transforming. We know that Jesus was transformed. John chapter 17 tells us that he was transformed before the very eyes of Peter and John and James on the Mount of Transfiguration. His glory was manifested, shown brighter than the sun. And when we think about the glory that is in us, we think about our lives being transformed by God, and that is through obedience. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us about that. I want us to look at that real quick. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us this. By the meekness and gentleness of Christ, I appeal to you, 
I, Paul, who am timid when face to face with you, but bold when away. I beg you that when I come, I may not have to be as bold as I expect to be towards some people who think that we live by the standards of this world. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. Now, Paul is saying here that transformation comes through obedience to the very mind of Christ. Being obedient to God's word is what is very, very important. All of us are called to be that. The E is for enduring. Jesus endured and he wants us to endure. And how do we do that? We do that through confidence. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that. And I want to read that. It says, So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere. The word persevere is also endure. So that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. God has promised to you and I the gift of eternal life. He wants us to have confidence, but he wants us to endure all the way to the end for that salvation that he has promised to give to us. And here he's saying we need to persevere, knowing that it is by being confident we're going to receive the great reward that God has for each and every one of us. All of this comes down to a, a, a very main thing that we have to keep in mind all the time, that the Christian life is a call to obedience, or to obey what God tells us. In Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 23, I'm just going to kind of emphasize what that's talking about. But in Romans chapter 6, it says, Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And God says, God forbid. How can we who are dead to sin continue any longer in it? So we know that we cannot possibly be able to live out the Christian life by the flesh. It's not even possible. But we live out the Christian life by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And when we look at Romans chapter 6, 15 through 23, this is what he's saying here. If we were thinking that we need to, con we can continue in sin, we got another thing coming, obviously, because if we're obedient to sin, we become a slave to sin, and that can lead to death. And the power of, of uh, sin is the law. So if we're trying to keep ourselves under the law, we're walking in the flesh. And through the flesh, we cannot be able to fulfill the righteous requirements of God. So what God tells us in Romans chapter 6 is that we are to obey or be servants to righteousness. And that leads to eternal life and peace. And that's all through the Holy Spirit who works in our spirit. So obedience is absolutely paramount in the life of a Christian, a born again believer in Christ. Now, I'd like to say it this way. God voted for you and for me. Yes. There's five things that God did in bringing you into this salvation that he has given to you. And the first one is that he chose you. He selected you. Jesus said it this way. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained or appointed you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you should ask of the Father in my name, he will give it to you. We see also that God has chosen us for what he sees we are, 
and who he believes we're going to become. He sees what you are, and he sees who you're becoming. And obviously, God knows our heart, because in 1 Samuel 7, chapter 16, verse 7, he says, man looks on the outward appearance, we see only on the outside, but it's God that looks on the heart. God knows what's in each and every one of us. And so when we think about what God is interested in, he that searches the heart knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because the Spirit intercedes for us according to the will of God. It tells us that in Romans chapter 8, verse 26. And since God looks into our heart, he knows what he sees us as and who he sees us becoming. And he knows that the whole work that he's going to be doing in our life is going to make is going to be making us more like his son Jesus. His righteousness is the only righteousness accepted in heaven. And by the power of the Holy Spirit working in and through our life, we see that God has chosen and selected us for the very express purpose of working out his counsel or his will in our life. The second thing is, is that God called you and me. Second Corinthians chapter six, I'd like to read that with you for now. Second Corinthians six verse one, it says, God, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. For he says, in the time of my favor, I heard you. And in the day of salvation, I helped you. I tell you, now is the time of God's favor. Now is the day of salvation. At the very acceptable time, God sent forth his son, born of a virgin and born under the law. And in the same tone, on the acceptable day, God heard you when you called upon him and God was there to help you on the day of salvation. So it was God who drew you to his son Jesus and it was God, the Father, who called you. He invited you to come to his son Jesus. And that can't be any more wonderful when we think about we can't earn salvation. We can't possibly get there in anything that we do on our own because God can't accept anything we do. It would be all through the power of the Holy Spirit that God accepts us and receives us by the grace that comes from God himself too. So he has chosen you and he called you. And the third thing he wants you to know is that he brought great conviction. Now that was by the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, verse 11, it tells us that um, the Holy Spirit um, he works the righteousness of God. He sees the sin. He sees the righteousness. And he sees the judgment that's to come upon every single person. So he is the one who convicts us of sin and of God's righteousness and of the judgment that is to come upon all people. And so the Holy Spirit convinces you that what God says is the truth. He doesn't mislead you, but he guides you to the truth. That's why the Holy Spirit is given to you and to me. The fourth thing is that it was confirmed by God. God chosen you, he's called you, he convicted you, and now he's confirmed it. In Ephesians chapter 1, I like to see that how God done this wonderful to realize that you're not here to try to work out your salvation alone that it's God that's in you to work and to do of his good pleasure so he's the one that's doing the work and of course it's the Holy Spirit that he's given to you in order to do that work it says in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 and you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation having believed you were marked with him or sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. 
And then also in chapter 4, verse 30, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. So the Holy Spirit is very, very important in all of this, and able to give us the righteousness of God, and to be able to give us the very presence of God into our, in our life. And so God has chosen you, He's called you, He's convicted you, and He's confirmed all of this by the Holy Spirit. And then it says in first, the Second Corinthians chapter 6, going back to the first verse again, as God's fellow workers, we urge you not to receive God's grace in vain. God does not want you and I to think that through our own effort we can attain eternal life. It's vain, is what he says, it's empty. And if we think that we've received the grace of God, but we maybe have not actually received it, where it's in our heart, then we would be trying to work out, be the Christian that we're not. We would profess to be a Christian, but we wouldn't even actually possess the gift of eternal life. The gift is given to everyone who calls upon the Lord Jesus Christ. But if I think that I can be able to work it out any way, any possible way, I'm deceiving myself and my faith is in vain. If Jesus wasn't raised from the dead, my faith would be in vain. And the grace of God would have no effect on my life. So it's through the grace of God that my life is being victorious. My life is overcoming. My life is being transformed. My, my life is enduring. As this salvation is being worked at in my life and through my life by God himself. And so don't receive the grace of God in vain, thinking that you have any part in the salvation itself. But working out the salvation is something that God is doing in you. And you and I, if we come to the fifth thing, is chosen, called, convicted, confirmed, and now cooperation. God wants us to cooperate with him. In James chapter 2, 